give my right to you turn me on, please. Thank you. There we go. All right. The book of Isaiah, if you will, uh, this morning. Again, it's good to see you in God's house today. Um, I want to preach to you this morning. Beautiful day uh, outside. Supposed to be 60 degrees today or so. And I want to ask you a question. Uh, I want to ask you this morning, how's your garden growing? How's your garden growing this morning? Linda, you said that wasn't a lot to work with. Well, sometimes I can't give you the message the night before because then you go ahead of me and then you might expect something different than what I'm preaching. So I did respond back to Linda last night. She said, you're not giving me a whole lot. But I told her she needed to be in church today uh, because we're going to do some gardening. Uh, Isaiah chapter number five, if you will. Again, it's good to see you. Good to have our visitors with us today. And of course, we miss those that are not here today by working or sickness or, or whatever the situation may be. But we're going to have a good time in the Lord. I want to read a few verses out of the book of Isaiah. And we'll get into the message again. We won't keep you very long today. And again, don't forget our uh, evening service this evening will be at 5 o'clock. Not because of the Super Bowl, but that is because uh, that is the new time uh, uh, here at the church. So we look forward to seeing you back tonight. Uh, we look, we're, we're glad to see the folks uh, uh, by way of Facebook today. And we want to give a big shout out again to our brother uh, Isaac, a man over in uh, Africa. And uh, we appreciate him and his family, and uh, we love them. And I told him I was going to shout out today. So, hey, brother, how are you all the way across the globe? Good to see you. And uh, we appreciate you praying for our church. But I um, want to preach a message today again. How is your garden growing? This message uh, this morning is going to be for the Christian. I want to help you this morning. Uh, we're obviously we're, we're vastly approaching, I believe, the rapture of the church. And uh, we got to get busy. Amen. Amen. And uh, there's a lot of work to be done, and I believe we've got a short time to do it. And uh, so, uh, again, I hope this will uh, minister to you. Well, I want you to look with me uh, this morning. You can keep your seat uh, at verse number one. This right here is a parable in the book of Isaiah. We think about parables being more in the New Testament, uh, but Isaiah has one here, and it reminds us of the different parables that we read in the book of Matthew, uh, Luke also, on vineyards, okay, and on uh, gardening, if you will. And I believe that when you leave today, uh, you'll be able to answer how your particular garden individually is growing. Uh, verse number one, chapter number five, the Bible says, Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. Well, that's a good thing. Amen. Mm -hmm. Got a vineyard, and it's in a fruitful hill. So we think this morning automatically that the vineyard ought to be doing pretty well. Uh, the Bible says, And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it. Uh, with the choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard, what could have done more to my vineyard uh, that I have not done uh, uh, that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked, bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. And I will lay it waste, and it shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall be I will also command the clouds that they rain no more upon it. The vineyard of the Lord of hosts in the house of Israel, and the men of Judah, his pleasant plant, and he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression or righteousness, but behold, a cry. Father, we're thankful for the reading of your word. God, I pray you bless the message. Father, give us the ears to hear, the lips to preach, God, and the minds, Lord, the hearts to understand and apply it to our lives this morning. We love you. God, we thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, this story, when I first was reading the book of Isaiah, started out pretty good. All right? He's got a vineyard. It sounds like it's doing pretty well. It's plant in the, in the, in the right place. Uh, it says it's on a fruitful hill. Uh, you know, he cleans it up. He plants it with the best plant, go on and on and on. But then all of a sudden, what happens? Uh, at harvest time, something happens that he didn't plan for. And instead of getting grapes, he got wild grapes. And I'm afraid that we're in the day now that people are not being careful and they're not taking care of their gardens. And they are now, uh, uh, it's come harvest, and you're getting something that you hadn't planned on. Uh, you're getting something that you didn't plant. And I want to think about this this morning. How is your garden growing? Um, why do you think here that God expects a good vineyard 
from those of us that are born again. Does everybody agree this morning that you, don't you think that God expects us to have a very successful, a very good vineyard, a well taken care of vineyard? Wouldn't you expect that this morning? Amen. As a Christian, do you not think that God uh, wants you in, in the house of God this morning? Amen. Do you not think that God wants you reading your Bible? Amen. I mean, these are basic things, praying, witnessing, uh, visiting the sick, going out to the nursing home like we're going to do today and preach and minister. Uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that we can do to maintain our garden, to maintain the crop. And the problem is, is if you don't take care of your garden, I can promise you it won't last long. I told you about Sherry's little tomato plants that I planted uh, uh, last year, and uh, my brother gave us a couple of tomato plants. He can grow anything. I mean, he can put a penny in the ground and grow a, uh, grow a quarter tree. I mean, that's just how he is. And I, I can kill anything. It don't take long, I can promise you. <laughs> but I went out there, my wife, we planted the, uh, the couple of tomato plants, and of course we put some miracle Grow or whatever that stuff is around them and put them in the right soil and it was hot but it's in a kind of a shady area of the yard and I boxed it in and everything and we did everything, you know, plant food and this and that and the other, made sure every day we were watering it and all of a sudden they, they started growing a little bit and a couple of days went by and she worked late and I her own other job working and, and, and you get home in the evening and it's 95 degrees or so and you look over and even though they've been in the shade most of the day, guess what? They're kind of wilting and uh, falling over and everything. Where we started uh, running a sprinkler and then we, uh, you know, we'd go hose it every day and do this and all of a sudden Brenda, that thing started growing and they grew and then she put some, uh, was it squash out or zucchini or whatever and all of a sudden, man, them things started growing and them things were like that big, you couldn't even see the box we planted them in, couldn't see the ground. Then all of a sudden, you got one tomato, two tomatoes and then all of a sudden you got tomatoes everywhere and it took a lot of work to maintain that little tiny garden. Mm -hmm. Now, if we'd have neglected it for three or four days, Guess what? They started leaning. And they started getting, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the branches or, and, and the leaves and stuff, they started getting kind of crumbly. And the ground got dry. And don't you understand today, that exemplifies what a Christian that is not serving God goes through. In, in this garden of life, if you will, if you neglect church, if you think missing church on Sunday ain't no big deal, look at your life for the month. That's all I'm going to tell you. All the woe is me, and I'm going through this, and I'm going through that, and you don't think there's an effect, a trickle-down effect, if you're not in the house of God, if you're not praying, if you're not studying, if you're not having fellowship with the, with the church crowd and everything, and you're out here in the world and everything, I can promise you, you you'll start seeing an effect within a few days. And the thing is, you know what you do? You think, well, it'll rain in a couple of days. That's what, what, that's what I said. I didn't want to get out there that one day and start watering and stuff. I was like, it's supposed to rain tomorrow. I'll just wait for the rain to come tomorrow. And that's what you do in your life. You wait on the rain. You procrastinate. Oh, it'll be all right. I can wait till next Sunday. It's all right missing this week. I'll, I'll get back to church next week. And, you know, if everything's going good in your life outside of church, you can't be in church when things are going good in your life Amen. so they continue to go good. Amen. But we don't do that. And all of a sudden, guess what? Starts getting a little stony and a little, little, little uh, uh, dry. The ground gets dry. We get dry. We start drying up. We're not doing the things that we we know we ought to be doing. But I asked you. I said, "Why do you think God expects a good vineyard?" Well, let me tell you why. And the Bible is very clear here. Number one, because of the quality of the plant. Now, let me tell you something. A tomato plant is a tomato plant is a tomato plant to me. Now, my brother will differ from. I'll say, I'm going to plant a tomato plant. He'll say, where well, you got to plant, you know, what are they? The little, I don't even know what you call them. Baby reds, Tommy Toes, this, that, whatever. Big boys. Big boys, boys, little boys, <laughs> medium boys, fat boys. <laughs> I don't know. All these names. Now, here's my thing. Tomatoes are tomatoes to me. Unless you buy them from Food Line. That's not a real tomato. All right? I don't want enough that's been processed in a warehouse. Put under a sun lamp. And I can eat a tomato sandwich from Food Line. Now I will eat one out of the garden. Mayonnaise, salt and pepper, hey, man. Man. that's good. Eating. Put some bacon on there. Anyway, I'm sorry, Muslims, I didn't mean to offend you. Amen. All right, anyway. So here's the thing. That tomato obviously makes a difference where you get it and the type you get. Right. Some's going to grow better than others. Some are going to be sweeter. Some are going to be harder. Some there's a lot of things that make up a good tomato sandwich, and I realize that. 
But I want you to look here at the quality of the plant. Look at verse number two. The Bible says he fenced it and he gathered out the stones and he planted it with the what? Choicest vine. Mm -hmm. Now don't tell me that a sirloin and a T-bone or a New York strip or a ribeye all taste the same. They don't. Mm -hmm. The best steak out there and, and, and really the most tender steak is up the lake. I just, that's why my wife and I never hardly have date night at the steakhouse, Richie. We go, to, we, go to, we go to Outback, she gets a steak that's about this big around and has it cut in half and filleted open so it looks this big. But when I eat it, it tastes this big and it's $22. All right? That's why we don't go eat there often. Now, I get a sirloin. My sirloin is about this big around for half the price and about that thick. And I'll sit there and she's eating hers, cutting it with a fork, eating it. I got A1 on mine. I'm using a chainsaw to cut it, and I need Linda's teeth to help me eat it. <laughs> now, guess what? I saved a little bit of money, but guess what? I got what I paid for. The Bible says that this vine was the choicest, and he built a tower in the midst of it, made a wine press therein, and looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. It was not what it was expected. Even though it was the choicest, all right? So the quality of the plant today matters. Before we got saved, we were dried up and withered plants, incapable of producing fruit. Now, I preach it all the time. No root, no fruit. Either you're saved or you're lost. Amen. Either you're confused or, I mean, there's something going on when people walk around and they absolutely produce no fruit in their life. Not one Big boy, little boy, fat boy, skinny boy, or whatever. No tomatoes at all. There's a problem. There's something wrong there. The Bible says everyone that says, Lord, Lord, will not enter the kingdom of heaven. There's something wrong there. Why are they saying, Lord, Lord? Why are they saying that? Because apparently they expected something. They expected to be in heaven. But they didn't have what it took. They didn't have being saved by grace through faith. They had a form of godliness and denied the power thereof. You know what they had? They had the wrong, they had the wrong quality of plant here. Listen, I can go out and I can plant something and put it in the ground and it die tomorrow. Or I can plant a quality plant and do the necessary steps and that thing will grow whenever I do what the instructions say. You know when you go to Lowe's and you buy a bush? It comes with a little thing on there and it's like this won't grow in sunlight. This will grow four feet tall and five feet wide. You gotta prune it, you gotta do this, and you got it'll tell you what kind of soil, it'll tell you everything. Now, me personally, I don't like instructions. I would rather go get something and do it my way and spend five days extra parts trying to do it my way only to realize that I should have read the instruction. Amen. The instruction is there for a reason. The instruction is there to help you. The instruction there is to save you from going through all the extra. And it's the same way with the Word of God. The instruction is here for a reason. If you ain't doing nothing but carrying it under your arm or use it as a door stopper, your uh, windshield to keep the sun out of your car, the instruction ain't going to do you no good. Amen. <clears throat> when you sit around and terrible thing. I ain't got no money. I ain't got the right man. I ain't, I ain't got this. I ain't got that. And everything. But you ain't graced the doors of the church in six months. Mm -hmm. Guess what? There's something wrong with the quality of the plant. Either you're, you're, and you're out of God's will or you're lost and you've never been born again. Mm -hmm. It's one of the two. Mm -hmm. But the Bible tells us mm -hmm. that the quality of the plant Listen, we were not capable of producing fruit when we were lost. Right. You know that? Right. I'm talking about real fruit. Amen. When I was a kid, I used to go to my great grandmother's. I'll never forget. She had a big old basket on her table in her dining room. And it had, man, apples that big, oranges that big, grapes, green, purple, everything. And I remember as a kid, man, I ran in there, couldn't wait to get in it. I grabbed one of them grapes and bit into it and about broke my tooth off. And all of a sudden, I felt a bunch of air in my mouth. Guess what? It wasn't real. They were plastic. They were plastic. I hope you see where I'm going. There's a lot of plastic 
people out here. There's a lot of fake people out here. There's a lot of so-called Christians out here. There's a lot of people that have a form of godliness. They put on the cloak before they come to church and they take it off when they go out the door. It's amen, amen in the church house and, and going down the road, it's God's name in vain. I mean, people live that life. So let's look at the quality of the plant here this morning. Because when you were lost, that's what you produced. And fake imitation fruit that was on the table of my grandmother's house. It wasn't real. But it looked real. From a distance, it looked good. But when you got up and we fruit inspect, we find out that it's not the real deal. So this morning, why does God expect a good vineyard? Because of the quality of the plants. And I'm going to talk about this. Listen, after we were saved, the Bible says God made us new. I believe that with all my heart. Amen. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, there's a reason the word behold is in there. I hear people quote that verse a lot. They say, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Become new. Behold! Behold! You know what the word behold stands for? It's letting you know there is a point in there that something dramatic, something extraordinary happened. And you know what? When Jesus was born, the angel said, Behold! Hey, God is telling us right here. Paul, the writer, is telling us, Listen, there is something that took place here. Behold! It means it's supposed to get our attention. It means that people ought to see something different in your life. Right. They ought to see a different walk, Amen. see a different walk. Behold, there is a new man. Right. Mm -hmm. You know what the problem is? I think we've left that behold out with a lot of people today in, the, in this church age that we're in. <clears throat> because there's not a change. Hmm. When we start inspecting the fruit, there is none. Number two, not only because of the quality of the plant, but because of the situation of the plant. Look at verse number one. He says, I'll sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. The situation. Well, it starts off letting us know that the vineyard was planted on a what? A fruitful hill. It started off the game. A fruitful hill. Let me ask you something today. I put this on Facebook last night. It was not meant, I don't care. You, sometimes, folks, you just got to understand a post is not for you. <laughs> There's a lot of people in this world. If God gives me a thought and I post it and you fit in there and you're like, I, he must be talking about me, I can promise you, you were not on my mind when I first posted it. I posted something last night about people bringing their kids to church. Mm -hmm. I said sometimes I feel like that I care about more, more about people's kids than they do. Mm -hmm. Can I tell you something? Uh -huh. When you're planting in your vineyard and you bring your kids to church, you started out on a fruitful hill. Mm -hmm. You're head of the game. That's right. There's kids that never ever set foot in a church their whole childhood. That's right. And you hear them, their testimony. I didn't go to church. My parents didn't take me to church. Yep. I didn't know nothing about church. I didn't know nothing about the Bible. But you know what? You're already ahead of the game if you bring them to church. Amen. They get a foundation. So because of the situation, the Bible says he fenced it. it says he's on a fruitful hill. He's doing these things. So we know it starts off right. Now listen to this. God has planted you today in a good spot if you're here in the church. Not mm -hmm. because I'm the pastor, but because of what the church stands for. Mm -hmm. Because of what we preach. Because of what the, the King James Bible. A lot of things. So you're in a good spot right now. And let me, let's take it a step further. Look where you were born. There's people that were born in Africa, in China, in nations where the word of God, you will lose your life for carrying the Bible. That's right. The most blessed nation Amen. of the entire world. Amen. Your vineyard, you started off good. You were not behind the eight ball. You get to come to church today. You get to, listen, I promise you, if we could ship you to China and leave you over there for about a year 
and you try to hit and miss church, over there you're not going to get to go to church. Right. You're, you're going you're gonna to pray that you have the opportunity. Right. When you live in these uh, countries that are poor, when they have to wade in mud and water and feces and all this, and they don't have running water and, and, and no plumbing and all that, and go through all of that and walk miles and miles and miles to hear a preacher preach the gospel, you'll appreciate the hill you were planted on. Amen. Amen. God allowed you to be born in the United States. That's why when these service people are out there and they're on the watch so you can be in church, Super Bowl on Sunday, Amen. they're on the watch so you can go to your family and visit and have Fourth of July and Thanksgiving and Christmas and all that, and they're sitting on the hill somewhere with a gun. You want to thank God every day that you live in the blessed nation, Amen. the most blessed nation in the Amen. entire world. Amen. God planted you. We live in a nation full of abundance and privilege. If I want to go get a hamburger, I go get a hamburger. There's a, there's a restaurant on every corner. There's a church on every corner. Right. If I don't like the Baptist church, I can go to the Methodist, go to the Presbyterian, go on and on and on. I can pick a flavor and go where I want to go. If I take a notion today and I and I get out of church over at the nursing home after a while and I got two hours to kill before I come back, if I wanted to drop down and, and, and play eight holes of golf, I can do it if I wanted to. Mm -hmm. We're in a free country. Right. Ain't nobody standing over my shoulder. Nobody's telling me what to preach. They try, but it, it don't work. Mm -hmm. But I'm a, excuse me, I'm allowed to come in the door anytime I want to in the church and Praise the living God. Amen. Amen. We have freedoms like no other nation to worship mm. and preach the gospel. We're not limited. They're trying, but we're not limited. Mm. Right. And we have prosperity like no other nation. Uh, the stock market was down a little bit this week only because of the coronavirus. It had nothing to do with the impeachment. Matter of fact, the impeachment, it's been going up. Uh -huh. And so we got a president that the stock market's been going crazy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the more they do to him, the more he just keeps on winning. Uh, I had to it. I'm sorry. I had, I had to, Richie, I had to say it this morning. They just, we just keep winning. Amen. That's the only pull I can do right now. Amen. Amen. I'll get another one on Wednesday. Yeah. By the way, we're having a we're having a State of the Union party coming up. For real. I like the State of the Union right now. Amen. I, I love this country, and I love the president, and I love that God Amen. has still blessing America. Amen. Prosperity like no other nation. Number three, because of the care that he gives to the plants. Verse number two again, the Bible says, and he fenced it. What is, why do we fence things? Protect them. To protect them. We protect them. People get mad about a border wall. Uh -huh. That wall is not to keep people out of our country that are coming here illegally. That wall is to keep people out of for breaking the law coming into our That's country right. and breaking the laws while they're here and not Amen, back. Brother. It's not about not loving people. It is about listen. If you go out here and you speed, oh, I tell you what. Here, here you go. How's this, Regina Tompkins? And I'm going to just give you a heads up tonight after the Super Bowl. If, if the 49ers win, and I'm upset that they won because I'm not a 49ers fan, mm -hmm. I think I'm going to come over and I just want to feel destructive because I'm going to probably lose everything that I got because I'm going to lay money on, and y'all know I don't gamble. I'm just, this is hypothetical. Don't go out of here saying the preacher gamble. <laughs> but I'm going to lay money on the Kansas City Chiefs. And if they lose tonight, Regina, I'm just going to come over and I'm going to kick your front door in tonight. I'm going to take everything in your house and I'm taking it to the pawn shop. <laughs> Devon's gun. His hats, he's got, a, he's got to have a bunch of hats, I know. <laughs> Cover that hat, he's got to have a bunch of hats. And I'm going to take everything, and I'm going to walk out with it, and oh, by the way, don't you call the police on me, because I might get offended and say that you're not a loving Christian person, because you didn't let me come in there and rob you blind, and, and, and maybe do something horrible to your family to get what I wanted. Folks, it's no different than the immigration law. Right. You can't break the law. Come here right. legally and be a legal citizen Amen. like everybody else. Amen. All right? Now, Amen. see, sometimes you've got to get a little education from the, from, from the church house. Amen. Amen. But here's what I'm talking about, folks. We put up fences because of what? We put it up to protect. The Bible says, and he gathered out stones. 
Can you do you understand that you can't grow a garden with a bunch of rock in there? Y'all know yeah. that. You can't do it. You gotta keep it picked up. Even the big old dirt pods, you gotta get that stuff out of there. You want the ground fine. You want to be able to turn it up. I, I went out here, I, I wanted to thank Frida so much, by the way, this morning. I'll, I'll get her when she comes back to church. But I came up here the other day and I just had this surgery on my arm, so my arm was hurt really bad. And, but I was determined to get that thing back in the ground that she hit. Now, there was a piece of that wood sticking out of the ground about that big. Now, I'm the one that put those things in the ground, along with a couple other men, a long time ago. And I forgot how deep I poured that concrete. But that, that, that concrete bottom was about this deep and about that big around. It's sitting inside a fellowship building if you don't believe it. I had to dig that thing out with a shovel though that's my bad arm. Now I can tell you something. I was digging and I was like, what in the world? The devil was all over me. I was like, God, you're going to have to help me. I'm on church property. I'm about to lose my religion. Yeah. <laughs> and I was digging and people were honking the horn. By the way, if you ever come by here and I'm working and you're not working with me, don't honk the horn. <laughs> all right, Amen. please don't honk the horn. <laughs> but I took that shovel and I put it in the ground and every time I'd go down and dig, I kept hitting Concrete. Mm -hmm. I was like, who in the world did this? And I remember I did, so I had a good fuss hold on. <laughs> but it was wide. But every time I'd get outside the width, I would hit something else, and it was concrete. You know what it was? It was excess that had poured over, and it was rock and all of that. And every time I would dig, I'd hit something. And I got thinking about the message. You can't go out there and put a tomato plant in that hole out there with all that concrete. Amen. You've got to plant when you plant your garden. You've got to plant it. You've got to get that ground ready. And serving God is the same way, folks. You've got to have the right kind of ground. Mm -hmm. You can't live like the devil, live like hell all week long, and come to church on Sunday and holler amen and think everything's going to be all right. Amen. You can't be away from the house of God for months and months and months. And listen, I'm glad when people come back to the Lord. But you can't be out months and months and months and show up one Sunday and think everything's going to be all right. Uh. I mean, don't you think that God, don't you think he's got a calendar? Mm -hmm. Amen, brother. Don't you think he don't know when you've been in church or when you ain't been in church? Yeah. And the thing is, we've got to work. Mm -hmm. And we've got to, we've got to maintain it. And we've got to get rid of the rock. We've got to get rid of the sin in our life. We've got to take care of it, cultivate it. The Bible's already said, hey, he planted it on the good, in a good spot. You're already planted, folks. Right. If you've got a church home, you've got a church home. And if they're preaching the gospel, there again, you're way ahead of the game. And so your church family and the pastor were helping you to get the ground right. Mm -hmm. It's not that I'm wanting to come up here and browbeat you and fuss at you and, and all of that. I want to encourage you. But sometimes encouragement has to come off. You know what? You can't encourage people sometimes by just rubbing their, stroking their hair and rubbing their back and patting them and say, everything's going to be okay. It's all right. Just throw your money in the offering plate. I promise you. It's going to be all right. Oh, yeah. I'll give you an extra prayer if you give an extra 10. That's not the way it works. That's right. you got to come to church and you got to be consistent. And you've got to do the things necessary. Because how miserable of a Christian life is it if you come out here and you go plant your garden and you dig? And you're like, hey, all right. This is how it works. I'm going to compare. You got a nice piece of land. It's cultivated right. You're about to put the tomato plant in the ground. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden, you're like, you're looking at it. You even take a picture and you send it, put it on Facebook. Look what I did. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, two days later, guess what? You kind of forgot about it a little bit. You're like, you know, that was kind of fun doing it the other day, but it's hot outside. I don't think I want to get out there and mess with that. Mm -hmm. Three or four days later, something happens. It rains, it's muddy, whatever. And all of a sudden, you start neglecting it. And that's how you do in church. Uh, you come, you get a boy. Let the preacher, let the preacher get fired up, and everybody gets fired up. I can raise my voice, y'all start hot, y'all start shouting. I guarantee you right now, if I did a backflip off the pool pulpit, everybody up here, I said, pool, everybody up here will be up and screaming and hollering. You'd be so full of the Holy Spirit because it's an emotion, and we 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 kind of we play off of what the pastor does. But what I'm telling you is, you ought to come to church every Sunday expecting God to move. Amen. You ought to come to church being in your spot today because, you know what? It's important for you to be in your spot every Sunday. Amen. Yep. And it's important for me when I preach to be able to look out and see your face and see that you're getting the help you needed. But when you neglect it, and you can neglect reading your Bible, and you neglect coming to Sunday school, and you neglect being a... Listen, when we have events at this church, it ain't so we can put it on Facebook and say, look what we did this week. 
The events that we plan, I hear people complain. Oh my gosh, we were so busy that month. If, if we don't do nothing, oh man, it's boring. We ain't doing nothing around here. We're going to go to another church because they got Awanas and they got, you know, on Tuesday night, they got they got uh, Olympic swimming at, in, 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 down in the baptistry. And I mean, they've got all these games and stuff. It's a no win. But the reason we do things is because it's not for your entertainment. It's for your fellowship. Mm -hmm. It's to keep you out of the world. It's to get you around like-minded Christian people so that you can grow. So that your garden will grow. So that maybe if the preacher's up here preaching, and maybe I hit on something, maybe you'll go to a sister in Christ and say, you know what, sis, I'm having this problem. You know I had that problem too. You know what the Bible says about this? This is how we get through it. Mm -hmm. But we don't do that. And then we wonder what has happened. We go out five days later, a, a week later, two months, two months later, show back up to church, and we wonder, we're like, I had somebody tell me this one time. <laughs> And I about, I'll be honest with you, brother, I about lost, I about lost my cookies right then. I had a lady tell me, she said, you know what, I'm a little disappointed. She's like, that message today, she goes, I didn't get a thing out of it. No. I said, really? And I was like, so I guess all these other people that were hooping and hollering and everything, there must have been something wrong with them. They must have been off their meds. I didn't say that, but that's what I was thinking. I didn't get nothing out of that message today. It bothered me for a minute. And then you know what God showed me? She hadn't been to church in four months. But she didn't get nothing out of the message today. Do you think it was the preacher? Or do you think it was the person? How, how can you come into church and neglect your garden and neglect your crop and then all of a sudden go out four months later and think that you're going to have Jack and the Beanstalk? It ain't going to happen. So, listen, because of the care he gives to the plants, the Bible says this in, jo in Job chapter number one, verse number 10. Hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. You know why? Because Job, listen, Job planted well. Even through everything that he went through, he still took care of that ground. He still served his God. A garden is fenced in to keep what? It's to keep predators out. Mm -hmm. Think about it. You plant a garden near the woods and you wonder what happened to your tomatoes. I can tell you. You're going to have a deer or a bear or some, something wild is going to walk in there, groundhog, whatever, fox, they're going to eat your garden. Right. So unless, hey, if, you, if you've got a garden planted out near the woods, you're asking for it. Mm -hmm. You don't see nothing on there, your garden very well can be growing, but you know what? The predators. Mm -hmm. you got to be careful, folks, when you plant. Protect your garden. Don't line up with somebody that is totally doctrinally different in, in belief. Listen, I'm going to tell you right now, that is unequally yoked. It's not just talking about marriages and saved people and lost people. It's talking about people. Listen, how many times have you had somebody to come through the church that believes totally different, and then all of a sudden they're like, oh, we like that church. We're going to get on board with what they believe. Mm -hmm. and folks, we don't believe anything far-fetched. We believe what the Bible says. The mm -hmm. Bible says it's right, it's right. If it's wrong, it's wrong. Mm -hmm. But they come in, and then all of a sudden, a month later, they want to change. You're telling me, well, I don't necessarily agree with this. I don't necessarily agree with that. I don't. I don't necessarily agree with. If you're saved, you're always saved. I don't necessarily agree. Uh, agree with. Don't necessarily agree with the uh, 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 the pre uh, uh, tribulation rapture. I believe it's going to happen after the tri you know three and a half years into the tribulation. And this, that, and the other. And all of a sudden, they don't believe. They don't believe. They don't believe. And you know what? At that point, it's time for them to go. Mm -hmm. If if God is not showing them anything, and that's their belief then you can peacefully get up and say, Pastor, I don't agree with it, whatever. We can be friends. With it. And let, but you know what they do? They try to infect. It's a predator. It's, it's a mentality. Mm -hmm. And so what they do is they, there's your garden. And, you, and you're not, you, you know, you're fenced, the word of God, what you've learned, what God has shown you through the Holy Spirit. You don't use any of that. And you're like, you're standing there. There's no fence. There's nothing around your garden. And you're just, you're, you're holding a big old sign saying, no, <laughs> And what they do is they come up and say, I can't believe your preacher preaches that. Listen, I came from this church down the road, and they do this, and guess what? They offer this and this and this and this. And before you know it, the predator has come into your garden, uh -huh. and not only is their garden demolished, or demolished and destroyed, now they're in yours. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to protect the garden so the garden can grow. I said on Wednesday night, I said I have a lady who said that. After coming here a year, she said one of the first things we noticed was how much you protect that church. How 
much that, you know, you stand up for your people. You think I do that because I want the stress of people slamming me on Facebook because I stood up for you? Maybe what your life used to be or something? Hey, I, I, I put a target on my back for people in this church because I love this church, and I think that the shepherd ought to take care of the sheep. Amen. amen. But I also believe that the sheep ought to show up, amen, amen. when the shepherd's trying to take care of them. <coughs> Amen. Don't go hang out in the world for six months of the year and never come to church and then expect the shepherd to pop up in the courtroom for you. Yep. God protects us from the flesh and the world. Defensive. We have his word to fight back with. Ephesians 6, 17, the Bible tells us that we're supposed to be wearing certain things. He says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Amen. There's your protection. There's your guide. There's your manual. There's your GPS for this life is right here. Mm -hmm. And so many people don't use it. So the Bible says that he gathers the stones out. Obstacles arise up in our lives as stones in the ground. Obstacles will keep you. Listen, obstacles will hurt you. Especially if you don't know how to get them removed. Mm -hmm. If you don't know how to go around them or over them. I played basketball in high school and I played football. And I could run really fast back in the day. But one thing I couldn't do very good was <clears throat> track. Like hurdles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I tried to jump in things, man, I hit them every time. I was like a self-destruction on, on the track. So I was like, the heck with this, I ain't doing nothing. Right? And I used to kid, so my buddies would run track while we were playing football, and they would also be track running. And what I would do was I'd get out there with them, and when we'd run, I'd run with them and keep up with them, and I'd come to the hurdle, and I'd go, whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> Even one time, did the wind blow. Uh, right? I learned to maneuver the obstacles. You've got to learn in this life as a Christian, when obstacles come your way, there's a way around them. There's maneuverability. You just can't stop and look at it and say, oh my gosh, my hips hurt. I woke up this morning, preacher, my hips hurt so bad, I couldn't get out of bed. I could, there's no way I could have drove my car. Well, preacher, you know what? I was holding some Cheetos about 1 o'clock in Walmart. They got them two for $4. I was able to maneuver, maneuver my big Buick down there, park, walk a half a mile, go in, get my Cheetos, and go back, get the car, and go back home. Preacher, I got home, and I, man, I hurt myself getting up the recliner. So I won't be back at church tonight either, preacher. Pray for me. My hip's out. <laughs> hurdles. Oh, we make the hurdles. A lot of them are self-inflicted. <laughs> God, then the Bible says he puts the tower in the midst of his garden. You know what the, you know what the, you know what the tower is for? Right. <laughs> God's in the middle of my garden. He watches. Pastor Tim, you better look. Look over on the, look over on the right flank over there. Look over on the left flank over there. Look down there. Look at the back of the garden over there. Preacher, you're not in the word like you ought to be. You know what? I see the devil and he's trying to come in the back of the garden now. Preacher, you better be careful because you're so wrapped up in these people's lives trying to help somebody do this that your focus has been taken away from something else. You better watch out, preacher. See, that's what the power's for. Mm -hmm. I'm glad I got a God in my life that watches out for me. Amen. He knows my needs. He knows when I'm headed for trouble. Amen. He, he watches all the time for us. I'm going to close on this last point here. God expects fruit from us at the right time. At the right time. Psalm chapter number one and verse uh, number one. The Bible says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in, in his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like what tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. In his season. In your season. In your season. Everybody, listen, tomatoes don't grow right now, do they? But they got a season, don't they? Apples don't grow at a certain time, but they grow at another time. Everybody has a season. The Bible says his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doth shall prosper. So God expects fruit at the right time. What's the right time for you? Glad you asked. I'm going to hit these and we'll go in the house. In times of prosperity in your life, when you get a new job, I see people on Facebook a lot. Pray for me. Pray for me. I, I'm about to land a new job. This job will change my life. Oh, brothers and sisters, pray for me. 
I need this job. I need that couple more dollars an hour. Pray, 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 pray. And all of a sudden, and a week or two later, you see, and boy, you're happy for them. Man, they got the new job. Yeah. You know what God expects from us when you get that new job? The fruit of gratitude. Uh, Thank God for it. Mm -hmm. Don't punish. Hey, listen, don't punish God and lay out of church because you've got a new job. Now, I understand if you got to work, and I, I understand that. But what I'm saying is, don't let things take you away from God. But if God blessed you, thank Him for it. Mm -hmm. Amen. I see people saying, pray for me all the time. And, and, and all of a sudden, they go on there and, whoo, got a new job, got more money. And next thing you know, they're at the beach or they're at the mountains. And they got a new car and they've done this and that. And not one time, through all of that prayer stuff that I read, do I see them going and say, thank God. God, yeah, you're good. worthy. God, you allowed it. God, it, it was only by you. They give him no praise at all. That's right. That's right. So in times of gaining or prosperity, God expects you to be grateful. Amen. Amen. Here's, here's one for all of us. In your times of affliction, God expects the fruit of trust and patience. Mm -hmm. Trust in him. I had a man to hit me left and right on Facebook this week after I did everything in my power as a pastor to help that man. But because of something altering his mind and everything, he posted some negative things. He took it right back off, though, and he, and he literally, he called me a pot and said, that wasn't me. But then two days later, he held it again. Uh, because his mind was altered again. And a couple of days later, he'd come back. And, and, and the thing was, what I was telling my wife, I said, I don't understand it. I don't understand how I can pray for somebody and be there and neglect my family and neglect my home and, and neglect the church and neglect people that I could be helping to try to invest and put all my apples in one basket for somebody. And I said, I don't get it how they can go out and say something that they know is not true when I try to help them. And it really gets you, it gets you to what you're hurt, but you get mad. Uh, but you know what I had to remind myself of? That I gotta have in, in, in those afflictions, I gotta have patience. Uh -huh. And I gotta have trust that God's good. And God did, He worked back. Mm -hmm. You gotta have patience and trust. Mm -hmm. Amen. In times of sickness, God expects the fruit of prayer. Pray. Just pray. Tell God your need. Understand that that is your source, that is your life source, your lifeline. In times of worship, God expects the fruit of attendance. How can you work? Don't tell me you worship God at home. If you can't get to the church house, I know you're not worshiping God at home. Don't give me this stuff. I turn my TV on and everything. Yeah, I'm sure you do. I'm sure you sit, Miss Brenda. They get a chair and they sit it in front of the TV and they watch Joel or or or, or Sally or, or 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 Joyce or some of these people on there and everything, uh, and, you, and your wallet's on fire the whole time while you're watching them, you know, your butt gets so tight because you think you're going to have to come off $5 watching them, but you don't want to give in the house of God, and you sit right there in your chair and you're watching TV, mm -hmm. and you don't move, now they're worshiping, they don't move for the whole, and none of them preachers preach longer than 10 minutes of anything of substance. But you're going to tell me you sit in front of that TV the whole time and listen to the message the whole time and never get up, go to the bathroom, get something to eat, vacuum, whatever. Bull. You might as well say that. I worship like I want to, preacher, at home. Sure you do. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I, I can see that kind of worshiping. Yeah, I have. And it shows that you have church at home. In times of worship, God expects attendance, the fruit of attendance. In times of opposition, God expects the fruit of us being steadfast. I'm gonna tell you something. You come at me, you come at me. And you know what I'm gonna do? I'm sticking. That's what, listen, if you want to knock me off, if you want to knock me off the word of God or try to knock me out of the pulpit or knock me out of standing for God or, or being a Christian, I'm gonna tell you, you're fighting a losing battle. Because you know what I do? I dig my heels in deeper. Don't tell me I can't do something. Mm -hmm. Don't tell me, don't, you know, but you know what it takes? It takes steadfastness. Does, do I get to that point sometimes? Absolutely. Do I get down and destroyed? Absolutely. Do I feel my balance rocking sometimes? Absolutely. But every time I do, I remember what God has done for me, what Amen. he's going to do for me, Amen. and I get to dig my heels in. It's got to dig in, folks. God expects the fruit of steadfastness. In times of trial, God expects the fruit of faithfulness. In times of need, God expects us to pray. In times of confusion, he expects us to read the Bible. In times of temptation, he expects the fruit of fleeing feet. You know what that means? Run from it. Mm -hmm. 
What's God if you go down to the beach and, and there's a bar on the corner and, 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 you're, and you're away from everybody? You and your boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, and nobody going to see me down here. Preacher's not down here. Nothing. Nobody. I don't know anybody. Come on, honey. Let's go in here and have a drink. That's when you need to have the fruit. Mm -hmm. Because you know what? If you're saved, you know what's going to happen? Nobody might not see you. You remember what I said the other day? You might hide it from the pastor, but you're not going to hide it from the master. Amen. God's going to see. Amen. If you've got anything in you that is real, you're going to be convicted of it. Uh, amen. In times of opportunity, God expects the fruit of witnessing every time you get a chance. Mm -hmm. Listen, I'll be honest with you. Every time I go out, I do not look in somebody's face and start talking to them about Jesus. I don't. But I can tell you, I never ever go out anywhere that I don't hand out a track. Leave it at the gas station. Leave it in the waste of can. Put it in the book, whatever. If I'm getting... I'm going to leave something behind. I'm going to be a witness. We don't always, listen, there's times for everybody. We, we all fail. We, we don't say, well, man, I ain't got time to get into conversation right now. I got to be at the doctor or whatever. But there's something to do a witness. Right. Even if you don't, you don't have the time at that point to carry on the conversation. God expects the uh, fruit with good quality. James 3 17, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruit, without partiality without hypocrisy. And then this is, this is, and I said I was closing, this is my last point here. God expects fruit with good quantity. Matthew 25, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but verse 14, the Bible talks about the kingdom of heaven being like a traveling man going into a far country. We know that, we know. All right? And the Bible tells us it's, it's, the, it's the parable of talents. We know how it ends. All right? And so, you know, at the very end, and you, you can look and later on, Matthew 25, verse 14 through 28, but at the very end, the Bible says, in verse number 28, take forth therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which hath ten talents. What did that guy do? Y'all, somebody tell me. He buried it. He said, I'm taking it. Everybody else, what? Grew it. God don't expect you to sit on it. God don't expect you to be a pew dweller your whole life. Oh, I'm going to sit on my salvation. I've got fire insurance. i got this policy that's going to keep me out of hell. And I'm going to sit here and I'm not going to be moved. And that's your favorite song. I shall not be moved. I'm sitting right here. Mm -hmm. And what we ought to be doing is we've got to be sharing. Mm -hmm. The most precious, the most worthy thing in this whole entire world that we've got that we can give away is the gospel. So God expects quantity. He expects us to witness to more people and more people and more people and more people. And you know, I just got to think of this. What about talking about consistency going on? What about fruitless endurance? How about that? I could just keep adding these. I want some of you already. Oh, oh God, I want to preach 10 more points. <laughs> 15 verse 16, one of my favorite verses. The Bible says, You've not chosen me, but I've chosen you. Okay? And ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. Thank you. I'm glad you said that. For fruit. Much fruit. Mm -hmm. Much. Thank you. I'm, you. That was perfect. Fruit. Yes? He didn't say a little bit of fruit. He said much. You should bring forth much fruit. But then, guess what? And that your fruit should do what? Remain. Remain. Now, have you ever, somebody go back and look at that verse. Remember I said about your Bible? Does the Bible say much fruit? Somebody look at it. Somebody look at it for me now, right now and tell me. Does the Bible use the word much? Somebody look it up right now and tell me. I just said much fruit and everybody said, Amen, preacher, much fruit. Look up John 15, 16 and somebody read the verse for me. Whoever gets it, just read it. That's John in the New Testament, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the Saint John. John 15, 16. Facebook's going to think nobody in the church has their Bible. Mm -hmm. Bring forth my praise to you that I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. Stop, and stop, stop, fruit. stop. He said fruit, and I said no. I said much, much, much fruit. Some people back there, much fruit. We've always heard. But you know what? The Bible, it says fruit. Yeah. It says fruit. But do you think that God's expecting us 
to just sit on it, mm -hmm. to tell one person, much fruit, mm -hmm. much fruit. But here's the, here's the part of the verse that's the most important, that your fruit should do what? Remain. Remain. Mm -hmm. remain. The problem today is we see no fruit. How can your fruit remain if you have none? Mm -hmm. And that's what you need to be checking on, folks. God has blessed us so much. What more can we do that we might be productive? I want you to think about that today. Enjoy those blessings because we can be very unproductive without God. Going forward today, I want you to remember the message. I want you to think about your ground. What kind of ground are you planting on? How are you harvesting? What's coming? Hey, what, what, what are you getting out of all this? I want you to think about that because you cannot plant on the stony ground. You cannot plant on ground that is it, it, uh, eventually that's just going to burn up and dry up. Right. I've given you everything that you need today to have a successful garden. So ask yourself later, how's your garden growing? I want you to stand, heads bowed, eyes closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed.